Hi there, welcome back again to the Ivory Tower Collections. This afternoon, I am going to be working on and showing the using an Intellivision 2 console from one of my clients recently sent in. The Intellivision console was one of the main competitors to the Atari 2600 in the early 80s. And uh, like a lot of consoles back then, it unfortunately only really featured one way of getting video and audio output from it, and that is from here, RF, yes. So of course that works well on most televisions, but it's not so great for modern televisions. And uh, especially if you want to do any kind of streaming or direct captures, it's just not really an option. You'd have to filter the RF through something else. And in any event, it's just not gonna look its best, is it? Today, we are going to install one of these. So let's talk about the tools that you'll probably need for this project. For starters, you're definitely going to need a number two Phillips screwdriver. This is going to be required so that you can open up the Intellivision as well as remove the main board. You're also going to need a good set of wire strippers. Always have that set of flush cutters handy or side cutters. Probably going to need some needle nose pliers. Make sure you got a toothbrush or some Q-tips to clean stuff with. A couple of optional tools. Make sure you got a good set of uh, electrical tweezers. It'll come in handy for whenever you're trying to grab onto some of the wires. Make sure that you've got yourself a marker of some sort or a pen. It can be a black Sharpie. I, I tend to use a silver Sharpie most of the time just because uh, I can see that easier on black surfaces, obviously, if I need to, or on darker surfaces. But yeah, this is to help you locate items that you're working on, or in the case of this particular installation, it will come in handy for marking the pens that we need to solder to. Other optional item is some possibly some electrical tape, or better, some kept on tape. Not optional. You should really always have some good flux on hand, period. You just need it. It's good stuff. It helps you out. Makes your soldering look good. You might also want to have some shrink tubing on hand. Doesn't have to be fancy. Can just, you know, make sure it's just the right diameter to do the job. I tend to have uh, assorted colors of shrink tubing available. So, you know, it helps me whenever I'm setting up different wires and getting things in place. And then of course, obviously you're gonna need good solder and your soldering iron and any other tools that you feel are required. But this is just a selection of the tools that I think are needed for this particular project. Here we are looking at the RGB board. This particular board is an older revision and was uh, created and designed by an Atari Age member who goes under the name The Crayon King. So this particular board, um, it's no longer available to actually buy in this particular configuration setup, but uh, that's okay because the creator of this is already in the works of making a second revision of this board that is more compatible with different RGB scalar devices than his current one that is being shown here is. But the process of the installation that I'm going to go through is going to be basically virtually the same with his newer revision board as with this older board. In fact, they look very similar to each other. So let's talk about this board in a little bit more detail. Specifically, why this particular one? Okay, well, there's been other RGB solutions in the past but they all suffer from the same similar issues. And this one is unfortunately no different, at least initially. That is that the main issue is that the Intellivision has some pretty strange video signals that it puts out. They're not exactly standardized and common. Specifically, the sync signal from it is pretty goofy and that causes a lot of havoc with things like the OSSC and potentially with the FrameMeister, etc. But it does happen to work in RGB quite well with one of the cheaper SCART RGB to HDMI converters. Go figure. But those have their own, you know, their own line of potential issues. But this particular board, and the reason why we're using it for today's install, is because it also has an alternate output method. In addition to having standard RGB output, you can also configure it for YUV, or component output as well. And that 
works quite well in my testing with both through my Xtron as well as through a RetroTank 2X uh, Pro. Not sure about the Classic, but it worked really well through the Pro. So I would suspect the Classic would be just about as comparable. So what do we have to do? Well, the board itself, as you can see, it's pretty tiny. It actually measures roughly, hold on a second. So it's roughly just under two inches in width and about an, and just under an inch and a half in length. And of course, because it's all SMD components and it's all on one surface on one top layer, it's very thin. And this is important because in the case of the Intellivision 2 especially, there's not a ton of room inside the Intellivision to mount additional components. So having a board that's nice and small and flat like this really helps us out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to show you specifically what I'm going to do to configure this board for component output only because it does have the means to add switches so that if you wanted to you could switch between RGB and component but again I want my client to have a reliable connection type that should work with all of their equipment so I'm going to specifically configure this for component output for now. Okay so here we are looking at the RGB board and I'm going to point out a couple things on here just so you can kind of get a layout of how it's designed. So for starters, you'll see that we have a set of input pads over here. We have some additional pads over here to be soldered to. This is where we get our 5 volt and ground to power the RGB board. And then up here at the top, we have some smaller pads that can be jumpered to enable different modes. We also have copies of those same pads, but with vias in place, so that you can actually install switches instead to switch between the modes instead of soldering them down or locking them down by uh, jumpering these pads. So what are these pads? Well, the first one here, which is already kind of shiny, but it's not actually connected, says SOG. That means sync on green. By the way, this is really only for RGB. Sync on green basically does just that. It uses the green output signal to generate a sync signal from. Some RGB devices are more compatible with this than others. The one next to it says COL for color. Well, this is actually the set of jumper pads to permanently lock it in YUV output or component output mode. Next to that, you'll see we have PAL. That does not mean PAL signal. That actually means palette. There are two default palettes programmed into this RGB board. And by default, it has a palette that, I'll be honest, I actually think works really well. I don't have a problem with it. The other palette, I think, makes things a little bit lighter in color. So instead of the ground and pitfall, for instance, looking more of a tan brown, it might look more of a cream color. And then next to this we have the vias, which do the exact same thing but allow you to wire in switches. So again, we have the PAL selector, so you could wire in a switch to select between the two palette modes. That might be something you might want to use. We have the switch, we have the uh, vias here that say YPBPR, <laughs> and that is for the YUV or component output, so you could wire a switch to that to switch between component or RGB. And then you have the sync on green option here. So again, you could install a switch to enable or disable sync on green. So we also have these uh, output resistors here, these 75 ohm surface mount resistors. Now on some RGB kits, the cables that you buy may already include the 75 ohm resistors inside of them. And my experience typically has been on RGB kits that I have to remove the 75 ohm resistors. You either have to have them there or you have to remove them. But here was the problem I ran into, at least with RGB, when I tried to use this. When I removed these resistors and tried to use this through RGB, I actually had an incredibly super dark picture and uh, could just barely make out any details. So at least in my case, I still had to have these resistors in place, even though I have the resistors already for attenuation inside of the SCART cables I use. But to be honest, the image looked fine. It wasn't super dark than normal. Uh, it was very comparable to most of my other RGB signals. So I'm going to advise that you at first leave these 75 ohm resistors in place and then test it out. And if it's way too bright, then you might try removing them just to see if it helps. But keep in mind, they are surface mount, so you know, don't lose them. Keep them on hand if you need to uh, reinstall them afterwards. Down here in the lower right hand corner are our output pads. As you can see, we have a 5 volt, a ground, B, G, R, and S. So, of course, these relate to a 5 volt and ground that you can run out to your AV uh, mini den jack, whatever you use. We have the blue, the green, and the red signal pads, and then we have the sync. Now, because I'm going to be wiring this up for component, I will only need the ground, the blue, the green, and the red. I will not need the 5 volt, and I will not need the sync lines 
to generate the component video output. So I'm only going to need to solder on four wires off of this sucker. Over here on the left hand side of the board, these are actually the input signal pads. So you will be attaching wires off of these pads to the color chip marked as U10 on the Intellivision itself in some various places. Now you'll notice that we already have some tinned pads in place for the ones marked 2, 3, 5, 6, and 7. 8 is not tinned up. That is because we don't need 8. We only need just the first 5 at the top here from 2, 3, 5, 6, and 7. However, these numbers do not actually correlate to the chip numbers or to the pin numbers that you will be soldering onto to the color chip. Just basically ignore these numbers, but you'll need to keep track of like which wire for like, for instance, pad number two here, you'll need to track where you've got that soldered two, three, five, six, and seven. Let's go ahead and uh, take apart the Intellivision 2 and discuss where we're gonna install this guy. To take apart an Intellivision 2 is actually very, very simple. You're only going to need one tool. Guess, yep, a number two Phillips. Seems to be the de facto standard tool for most of these older consoles, and it's no exception with the Intellivision 2. Except that in the case of the Intellivision 2, it's even easier than you might think, because we only have two screws that need to come out. Located here and over here where the cartridge slot is located. These are basically in the front section of the Intellivision. You can see there's the front of it there, right? So I'm going to go ahead and get these out of here real quick. By the way, the screws that are used in the Intellivision 2 are actually the exact same screws that were used in the Model 1. They're even the same length, if I'm not mistaken. There we go. Just going to set these off to the side. They're basically these, uh, I don't know, what are they, about an inch? Just under an inch. Once you've got those two screws removed, <laughs> this is the best part about it. The Intellivision 2 was kind of designed for stuff like this, if you can believe that. Whereas a lot of consoles can be tricky to get into, the Model 2 is very easy. Once you've got those two screws out, you just have to lift up the front of it. It's got these hinges along the back side, and you just remove the top cover. Easy enough. You'll also notice there's very little to absolutely no RF shielding inside the Intellivision 2. Yeah, that's an interesting thing as well. Okay, so let's talk about where we're going to put this chip, or this board. Again, it's not very large, it's fairly small. So in theory, if you wanted to, you could mount it, you know, on top of some of these other chips, sort of like that. But I would advise against this because you'll notice that these are fairly large IC chips. These actually do get quite warm and quite hot. Although I think these are newer CMOS versions that don't get as warm as the original ones because they don't have the heat sinks on them like the originals did, they still get very warm, especially the graphics chip over here. This really gets hot. But while we're looking at this, I want you to take note of this particular little chip right here. It's directly underneath the crystal, the main crystal for the system. This is U10. This is the color chip right here, the AY3-8915. And it is on this chip that we will be soldering wires to. Now, in this particular case on the Intellivision Model 2, you could solder to the top of the chip. However, there's not a ton of room here so what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this main board out of here and I'm actually going to install that board and do all my, most of my solder work on the bottom side of the PCB where there's actually plenty of room and that also keeps it away from the heat of the main chips themselves. So I'm gonna get this main board removed from the Intellivision 2. It's actually very easy as well. Again, you just need the number two Phillips. You've got two small screws over here on either side of the cartridge port these have basically a uh, flattened wider head on them. Not sure if that'll, that can be seen as easily in, in the camera. Okay, That's because they are part of holding down the plastic frame that goes around the actual cartridge port itself. And then we have two more Phillips heads. They're basically the exact same length, but they don't have the, the wider head on them. See? And those we have uh, directly in the center of the board on the north and south end of it here. That's it. Once you've got those out of there, you can actually take the whole board and kind of weasel it out of here. Now it is, it is sitting on a little ledge and there's some little catches on the side of the case over here that it kind of wedges into. So I kind of have to lift it up on one side and start to pull 
towards the right here as I remove it. But once it's out, don't need the rest of it. We're good. Okay, so before I flip this thing over, a couple things to be careful of, because as you're working on this, you're probably gonna have it facing the other direction. You have a light pipe right here that feeds up to the top of the case to as your power indicator. I would recommend, so that you don't accidentally break this off while you're working on it, I would recommend that you temporarily remove this. It's very easy to remove. Let me flip it around again, right here. It's actually just a piece of uh, plastic or Lexan that's just snapped into place on the main board. You've got two little clear snaps right here. So if you basically just kind of take your thumb here and just kind of push on either side like that, you can just wiggle it right on out. Set that somewhere safe. Now we run much less risk of damaging it or breaking it as we work on the board. So here we are looking at the bottom of the Intellivision board. And, uh, you know, you can see that it's, it's got a lot of pens, a lot of things here, but there's also lots of places where we can attach this RGB board and to be able to have access to the inputs and the outputs as we need. My recommendation is that you could attach it somehow in this corner like that or perhaps, you know, over here, you're gonna have the pins. So what I would recommend to you to do is to get some sort of insulation tape to cover on the back side of the board, and then whatever other method you decide to use to hold it and fasten it in place. But you wanna take into consideration where you need to put your outputs. So keep in mind that in this particular install, again, these are the input pins and these are the output pins. Since this is the back side of the console, it might actually be better to try and find a method to mount it on the back side off to this direction here. Why, you might ask? Well, because this row of pins right here, if I'm not mistaken, are the uh, pins that we need to solder onto for this to work. And these are the output pads here, so they're already in a nice, good, even direction for us to get out. But just keep in mind the bottom of the console shell. Again, it's fairly open inside, all of this open space. And uh, we've got at least a good centimeter to work with here as far as the depth of the console goes. Um, because component wire usually has, or component cables usually have your standard RCAs like this red, green, and blue in the center for the video. And then here is the audio lines for red and white for your left and right audio. Most people would install actual RCA jacks color matched. However, there's not that much space here. And as a result, installing RCA jacks, once you put you know the proper washers and such in place and be able to access them, it's really close to the main board where it mounts and you could run the risk of shorting. So, I mean, if you can find a way to make absolutely sure you can isolate it, sure, go ahead and, and install some RCA jacks along the back sides here uh, between these boss posts so that, you, so that you could do that. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to install my left and right audio over here in this empty corner. Over here, there's just, this is all empty space. Even with the main board in place, this is empty space. So I've got plenty of room to install my uh, left and right audio jacks. So I will install those there. And then what I'm going to do on this installation is I'm actually going to use a four conductor TRRS jack right here. And again, it's four conductor because I need three separate signals plus the ground for component. And what plugs into the other end of that? Well, it will be one of these component breakout cables right here. This is very common uh, to what comes on some EVs that don't want to provide separate RCA jacks for the component. They'll, they'll actually have a similar TRRS jack installed inside of them uh, and come with one of these cables to break it out. And that's what I'm going to do here. Because this is all plastic here, I don't have to worry about it shorting on anything and it's a little smaller diameter. So I'll be able to install this basically somewhere like around there is my thinking. And then again, I'll have my, you know, my left and right RCAs. When I have it all in place, I'll have it sitting like that. And then on the back side, of course, I'll have this cable here will plug into 
that TRS jack and be able to provide us with our video green, blue, red connections and the and then you could run the, the left right audio directly off these RCAs here. So yeah, that's how this is going to be set up on this particular install. You know, it's minimal drilling required and it uh, should look fairly clean when it's all in place. Okay, so with that, uh, let's get that main board back out here and let's get to soldering up some wires, huh? Okay, here we are. I've got the uh, PCB kind of on a little PCB mount here just to kind of help me uh, uh, keep this stable and steady so I can show you where everything needs to go. So located in this section right here is where U10 is, or the color chip. Now, because we're looking at the bottom side of the PCB, you need to be aware of where pin 1 is. That's because the specific pins that we need to solder our wires to are pins 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And these are, in fact, 18-pin IC chips. So in looking at this from the bottom side, now this is where the RF modulator is, so kind of kind of use that as your guide to kind of know where the where the chip is because again here's where the RF modulator sits and then um, over here is one of the uh, uh, bracket screws that holds down the power supply regulator board inside and it's basically just two or to the right of that in your particular perspective so along the bottom section here as you're looking at this this is where pins one through nine are located and off to the far right hand side as you have again if you've got the RF modulator facing you down here is where pin one's going to be then two three four five six seven and eight and again the pins that we are specifically soldering onto are four five six seven and eight right there those five are the ones that we need to solder onto so again, that kind of gives us an idea as to the best way to essentially lay out our board. So I had suggested earlier about, you know, potentially, you know, putting it over here by the RF modulator and, and that would give your inputs fairly short distances to run to, but then your output lines have to run an even further distance out. So what I'm probably going to do is I will probably... You know what, I'll probably just put it right in the center. Yeah, that'll work. I mean, you know, the pads that I use, like I said, they stick in there really well. It should hold them just fine. And this way, again, my input wires can remain fairly short, and then my output wires will go basically right where I need them to go. Now, I would advise that you pretty much use stranded wire for all of this. I mean, you can use solid core if you'd rather for your input lines, because again, this isn't going to move around much. But for your output lines, you should always use stranded wire in this case because there's going to be some flexibility there. You know, if you ever have to remove the board, you want to make sure you give yourself plenty of extra wire to, to be able to navigate around. And then uh, the only other things I need to worry about really wiring up is I do have to wire in a clock signal that goes up here, and that goes into one of the other pads up on the opposite side of U10. So again, fairly easy reach there. And then, uh, of course, I have to source 5 volt and ground. But uh, that really shouldn't be difficult. You can source 5 volt, uh, I believe, from pin 13 off of U10 here. So, you know, it wouldn't be too much of a distance. Just search around on the board. There's going to be plenty of places, I'm sure, where you'll be able to find 5 volts that you could solder onto. And same thing with ground. I mean, the whole outside plane of this thing is just one giant ground plane. So, you know, ground should be fairly easy and just solder it down to any ground point that you locate. Right? So, what I'm going to do is to help me out a little bit, I'm going to put some fresh solder onto these pads just to tin them all up where I need to, and then I'll go ahead and clean up the PCB on the bottom and on the bottom side of the board, and uh, I'll attach it down into place roughly where I want it to go. Okay. I've now got this RGB board installed. So what I did just to make sure that I had good secure fitting on here was I took my flush cutters and on quite a few of the IC chip legs around this area, I just trimmed them up a little bit as you know a little bit more flush and flat with the PCB board. Not enough that you can't still get in there and remove them if you need to or be able to insert them into sockets, but just enough to be able to to give a a stronger securing fit for the Velcro pads that I use. I also could have used maybe thinner strips of Velcro that could have gone in between the IC chips. That would have worked as well, but this will be fine, and I know that it's secure and not going anywhere. And as you can see, I basically mounted the board directly in the center here. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tin up these pads and get them ready to solder some wires to them.
Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply some solder onto the actual pad here to lock it down into YUV component output only. It's, again, it's these two little pads here that just says COL at the top. So all I'm going to need to do is just put my iron on there and apply a little bit of solder to bridge those pads across. Just like that. So from here, all that's left to do is to get some wire and trim it up as needed and be able to solder from the input points here on the board and attach them where they need to, to U10 along the chip side here. And then to get some wires ready for my output as for my output lines. Additionally, of course, I'll need to solder in my uh, five volt and ground for the board to operate on and another wire for the clock pen here. So there we go. I've got my input wires from where they need to come off of the U10 chip here and attached where they need to on the RGB board here. So what's left to do at this point is to go ahead and solder in some additional wires for my outputs. Again, I'll just need to attach a wire for ground and then it's marked blue, green, and red here, but those will actually correlate to the component YUV outputs. I now have some output wires in place here. You'll see that I've gone ahead and color coded them. You don't have to, of course, but I would advise that you use different colors so that you know what needs to be what when it connects up to the connectors. So yeah, again, just to kind of refresh real quick what I've done here. Let's start from the uh, upper uh, right hand section here, or the upper left as the uh, video view may be. So we have our clock signal here and it attaches and needs to attach to pin 15 off of the U10 chip. I happen to find an unused pad over here for that purpose. And then connections 2, 3, 5, 6, and 7 correlate to the different signal inputs off of the U10 chip with pin with pad number 2 going to pin 4, 3 goes to pin 5, 5 goes to 6, 6 goes to 7, and 7 goes to 8, like you can see here. I need to have 5 volt and ground attached, so I have my 5 volts just attached over here to a... Basically, it's attached off to pins, I believe it's 16 and 17, off of U10, because all of that is plus 5. It's actually attached to pin 13, but it's all the same. And then uh, ground, I just have attached over here to a large ground plane here. You could also attach it off of pin 1 from U10 as well. That's even closer, in fact. But this is a nice large area, and I knew it would work well for that. So yeah, from here, all I need to do really is just to run these output wires, attach them up to my TRRS jack here, where they need to go, and then uh, mount it all into place. So one of the other things you're going to need to do is you're going to need to verify which one of the ends off of your little TRRS jack here meets up with whichever cable end here on your breakout. And the easiest way to do this is to simply plug it in to the jack like this and then take a multimeter, put it in continuity mode so that it beeps whenever the ends are pushed together so that you know you have good connectivity and then you want to just start verifying what's what. So what I'm going to do is, let's see, let's first find the ground. And all three of these should have the same ground. And a real easy way to test this 
is to figure out which one's ground. Okay, looks like it's this one here. There we go. Okay. So once you've found the ground, I go ahead and I mark it with something. In this case, I used a silver Sharpie. Yes, I verified this ahead of time, but just showing you what I did. Now, once I have that figured out, I'll go ahead and just to make it easier for myself, I'll go ahead and take the wire that I'm going to need and I'll get it ready to go so that I can get it soldered in. So however you want to put these in is fine. I usually tend to kind of put them in a little bit and then I'll do the little, what we call the little J-hook. And then I might need to use some uh, tweezers or something like that to uh, crimp it down straight. As flat as I can like that. And then uh, I'll go ahead and hit that up with some solder on the end. It's already quite a bit on my iron here that that's okay. Just like that. I have a small piece of uh, clear shrink tubing that I can use for this. And put that over it like that so that I can see where that needs to go. And then uh, I'll go ahead and get that shrunk on real quick. And what I'll do is, is I'll just follow suit with all the rest. I'll find out which color goes to which of the leads. I'll solder on my wire on the end of it real quick and then go ahead and apply the shrink tubing. Now, one of the last things we need to talk about is how to run your audio, because obviously you're going to need to be able to hear what's going on when playing the games, right? So what I'm going to show you here is just one of the easiest locations where you can get your audio from. So if you'll notice, I have the RF modulator here, and the second wire that goes into the RF modulator, I'm just barely pointing to it here. Hopefully you can see that. There's a little ceramic disc cap that's in the way. Anyway. There's a number three in the letter A marked next to this, and there's actually two, or there's actually an unused via and a pad right here in this area attached to this. This is the audio input line into the RF modulator. So what you can do is you can literally just solder a wire. You can just solder your wire directly off of this and run it out to your AV jacks or out to your audio RCA jacks or whatever you're going to use to output your audio. Now what I'm going to do in this case is I've already got some wire essentially ready to go here that I'm going to cut. And uh, basically I'm just going to attach, in this case I'm going to use the yellow as my audio out and then the orange that's attached on it I'm just going to attach to a ground, uh, to a ground point somewhere on the main board. Which again, there's lots of places. I'll probably just run a wire over to here. There's a unused via right here on this uh, ground plane. That's a perfect place for it. So what I'll probably do is uh, I'll either solder a small piece of that yellow wire from off of here, and then I'll attach the other end of it to a little 10 microfarad capacitor just to provide some additional filtering. This isn't absolutely necessary. In fact, I've done quite a few. In, in fact, my personal Intellivision doesn't even have a capacitor on it, or at least my Model 1 doesn't. Uh, but it's just, you know, just another little thing to just kind of help out with stuff. In fact, I've already kind of got this capacitor formed in such a way that uh, I'll be able to take the positive lead. And whenever you do this, do make sure you put it the right way. You're going to want your positive lead to be attached to your audio source on the main board. And then you're going to want to run the negative lead off the capacitor. You're going to want to run that off towards your AV jacks or to your audio jacks. So I'm going to go ahead and get this wired in real quick and uh, show you what it looks like. And that will be it. I should be ready to test it. So I will uh, pause it here and uh, show you the uh, final installation and uh, some onboard results.